Uh, as the brethren were sharing, I, my mind couldn't help going back to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation as a book was a series of visions and revelations to John, the disciple, the apostle. But there's a couple of chapters there in which the Lord himself now, this is not just the Jesus, you know, while he was in, in the, his earthly flesh. This was, the, this was the risen Lord. This was the one who he saw in the beginning of, of chapter 1 there. It was so brilliant, so blinding, the light, the vision of who he was and what he was. This was that one speaking messages to the churches, to different churches, and each of them had their own unique needs. But in, chapter, in verse 14 of chapter 3, we read the letter to the church in Laodicea. And Jesus is talking and he's saying, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness. So this was something they could take to the bank. This was the reality. This, was what it, this is how it really was. It says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say... I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve, salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and chasten, so be earnest and repent. I'm going to stop there for the moment. But this was a church that had become complacent. And you know, uh, it's been mentioned by several that the devil has his guns trained at the church. The devil's not stupid. He knows how to size up weaknesses that different ones have. He does it on an individual level, but he does it on a church-wide level as well. And this particular church lived in a prosperous city. And so they partook of that prosperity. They were, uh, I mean, their businesses were, were doing be much better than other people. You know, you had the uh, passages where we, we see how the saints of Jerusalem, for example, were poor and lived very hard lives. But these people weren't like that. They lived in a very prosperous place. Business was good, life was easy, and they came to the place where they said, I believe the right stuff, I'm doing the right stuff, everything is okay, I don't really have any need. You know, the time when we have the greatest need is the time when we say, I don't need anything. That is the absolute symptom that we need to be concerned about. If you get to a place where you feel like everything is good and you're doing fine, you are in deep trouble. Satan has you right where he wants you. He's put you to sleep. Because the fact is, no matter how far along we are in our spiritual lives, there are needs that are real, that are deep. We are so far short of where the Lord is taking us. And only he can take us there. Simply adopting a religion and practicing it is no substitute for what God has to fulfill his purpose, for, not only for ourselves individually, but for us as a church. And the, the threat of, if you want to call it that, the consequence of this condition was that he was about to spit them out of his mouth. I mean, they were coming to the point where they were of no use to him. They were not able to represent him in the world. And, and the Lord could not say, hey, look at them. Don't you want what they have? It was, that, that opportunity was gone. They were just so much like the world. I mean, they had a little veneer of, of religion and morality, and they were, you know, nice people and all that stuff. But really, fundamentally, there wasn't that much different. They were interested in self. They had sort of co-opted the truth. They had co-opted what they had learned of Jesus, and it had become just simply a part of their lives. It was about self. It was about me and what I want in this life. And I'm so glad that Jesus has given me a hope of heaven and he's taught me some good principles so I can live more successfully here. That's the gospel to a lot of people. That's not the gospel. 
Nor is, nor is simply believing and doing all the right stuff what God is after. That's a hands-off relationship. That's, that's the relationship that the Israelites, the unbelieving Israelites, wanted with God. They told Moses, we're afraid of him. I'm paraphrasing. You just go find out what he wants, come back and tell us, and we'll do that. But we don't want to have anything really to do with him. We're just sort of afraid of him. And oh, a lot of people want that kind of religion. Just tell me what to do. I'll do it, and everything's okay, and otherwise I can go about my life. No, that's not what he's after. He's after a relationship. He's after something that is real. Now, I'll go back, I'll go down to verse 20. What is the... Uh, what is the repentance? Now, now notice in verse, uh, verse 19, is it? Those whom I love. See, this wasn't somebody Jesus hated. Jesus didn't come in with thunders of condemnation. This was, an, this was a wooing heart. This was a heart that reached out, saying, I so long to embrace you. I have so much for you. I want to share my heart with you. I want you to experience the reality of my love. Those of my love, I rebuke. Oh, I praise God. Every rebuke that he has is, comes from a heart that, is, that loves me. You can receive that kind of a rebuke. We ought to receive it anyway. But I'm so thankful. That's his character. We need to understand. You need to understand that. You need to look in the mirror and be able to say, but in faith, God loves me. Yeah, there's a lot wrong with me, but God loves me. He loves me. He's concerned about me. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. But here's the amazing thing that gets to the heart, I believe, of what the brethren have been sharing. Jesus says to them, here I am. Here I am. You're doing all the stuff, but here I am. It comes down to a person, doesn't it? Yes. Our faith comes down to a relationship with a person who's real. You can't see him now with natural eyes, but he's real. And you can know that. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. So here's a church. Where's Jesus at? They're meeting. They're talking about the Bible. They're singing hymns. Where's Jesus? He's outside. That's not a good thing, is it? I appreciate the Lord's presence this morning. I believe he's, I believe he's here. I believe he's, you know, I, I, th I think this is just a, a warning sh uh, shot over the bow, if you will, that God is concerned that we not get in this condition. It is so easy. We live in a country that in spite of all the shaking that's going on, we still are in a place of basically a prosperity and ease. It is so easy just to take Jesus and add him to our lives and just go on about our business and say, what's the problem? I'm doing great. Everything is fine. But have no real relationship one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. If we don't have that, if we're not hungry, something is missing. Something is, something is terribly missing. Satan has got you right where he wants you. You're in a place where a vulnerability so Jesus is saying, here I am, I stand at the door, and I'm not just standing there, I'm knocking, I'm trying to get your attention. Hey, something's missing here, I, you're going about your religion, I, 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 need to, I need to get with you here. You need me, you don't just need my religion, There's, religion will send you to hell, Jesus will save you. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock, if anyone hears my voice... You know, if we're going to hear his voice, we've got to have a listening ear, don't we? We've got to be able, have a willingness to, to just not so be engaged in the world and our own little thing that we tune Jesus out. God help me. I mean, I, I feel like this is one of those services where I would, be, I would have been glad to just sit there. Because I'm in as much need of this as anybody here. We are we're in a vulnerable place. Satan knows how to attack us. And I think the greatest attack that he can make upon anybody is in a place of ease just to put them to sleep. And to say, what's the problem? We got, you know, we, got, we come together, the Lord's there, it's wonderful, you know, hallelujah, and then just go our way and be so, and have no real one-on-one -on -one relationship with him. 